Hello, Abutus from around the world. My name is Kais and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Abut Zoom session where me and my co-host Aziz, who is 11 years old and lives in Tunis, Tunisia, will be interviewing our guest change maker, El Seed, who is based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. El Seed is a world acclaimed artist who uses Arabic calligraphy and unique style to spread messages of peace and unity. We hope that you will enjoy the session now. Now, start with our first question to our guest. Can you please tell us a, a little bit about what you do and what you do for work? Thank you, Qais. Thank you, Aziz, for hosting me. Uh, super happy to be here, actually. Uh, so my name is El Cid, and what I do is um, I, uh, I create, uh, I'm an artist who create actually large scale uh, uh, mural and sculpture and installation on the public space all around the world. I use mainly and mostly uh, Arabic calligraphy. And uh, I always write messages. So I'm trying to uh, to write messages that are relevant to the place where I'm creating my artwork, but uh, something that has this universal dimension so anybody around the world can relate to it. And uh, I like to say that today I use uh, art as a pretext, you know, pretext to highlight, uh, I would say, a community to raise a topic that is close to my heart or, you know, just for the beauty of it. Okay. What's your favorite art piece that you made? Favorite one? Uh, that's difficult. Each piece that I created as a as a special story, you know, I've like made huge art piece that have like maybe a deeper story, and have like smaller one who still have a story and uh, and um, and that have like uh, memories that are linked to it. I, as an artist, I always say that I collect moment, you know, and so each artwork has a is a special moment, you know, in my life. So I don't think there is one piece that is my favorite. I think each one is special. Uh, so yeah, it will be difficult for me to tell you which one I love the most. Um, how do you uh, choose the locations of your projects and their meanings? Um, actually, you know, for example, there is a, it always starts with, with a topic, you know, for example, uh, uh, let's look at one of the biggest projects I did was uh, called Perception. It was inside the garbage collector neighborhood of Cairo. And I wanted to raise the topic of perception, you know, how sometimes uh, people in society can judge a community or another person based, you know, on like their, you know, on the wrong ID. And, uh, and this community of garbage collector in Cairo, they're marginalized because they are uh, they're associated with trash. So I think this place was the most relevant place and the perfect place actually to speak about perception, you know? And that's how I go. I have like one topic, then I found the place, then I go and I try to create an art piece that can connect, you know, the place and the topic together. So there is a lot of background research, you know, that usually people don't see. But um, yeah, I spend a lot, a lot of time actually into this, like in studying the subject and and trying to find the uh, to find the right spot. Do you always involve your kid? Uh, do you always involve kids in your artwork? Kid in my artwork? Yeah. You mean like young people? Yeah. Uh, younger than me? Uh, not necessarily, but I I, I like you know to um, I like to make my work a kind of a participative work. You know, I like to invite people to be part of the uh, of the production of it. So I um, I like to make sure that people, you know, in a place or in a community will say, look, yeah, I was part of this. You know, for example, uh, there is, um, I mean, there's this guy, this kid, I mean, he's not a kid now, he's 26. I met him when he was uh, 16, 10 years ago in Tunisia. His name was Mehdi. And I was painting this wall in Kairouan. And then he came and he, uh, he asked me what I was doing. So I invited him to, uh, to paint with me, I say, look, you know, I'm going to trace the calligraphy. You're going to fill up the space with the color that I give you. So his work was just filling up some colors, you know, but uh, he got involved, him and so many, like six other people for 10 days. And now Mehdi actually work with me, uh, actually is the one who document all my work, you know. And um, so the, the point of having, you know, young people or even older to be involved into an artwork is to um, give them sometimes the ownership of an art piece and also uh, to inspire, you know, I think it's super important to, uh, yeah, to, to inspire people, you know, the same way I was inspired by 
some great people that try at some point to be an inspiration for other people as well. What did you study to be prepared to do this work? What did I study? My question too is what you want to do later and I will tell you what I study to do this kind of work. What do you want to do when you grow up, guys? Um, be an artist, I think. That's good. Thing, I man. have no idea. You don't know yet? Okay. No, I mean, don't worry, it's fine. It's still cool. Uh, you know me, actually, I since I'm a kid, I, I paint and I draw, but uh, I didn't follow like an artistic path in a, like in an academic way. Um, I have a, a Doug Deco, I don't know if you see this in English. Uh, I studied economics and business, so I have a master's degree in supply chain management. Uh, so I used to be a supply chain manager in New York, then I was a, I used to be a business consultant specialized in supply chain management in Montreal. And um, I gave up my job, actually, my job as a consultant 10 years ago, no more, 11 years ago, 2010, when my daughter Maya, she was born, um, just to focus in, into my art. Um, I felt I was not uh, fulfilling myself as a business consultant. And, uh, and I was just painting, you know, on the side, just to um, give myself, you know, a kind of release from the uh, corporate world. And, um, and so I used to have this kind of uh, discipline where every weekend I used to paint. No matter what was happening, I was painting. And, and what I learned, I think, as a, you know, in the supply chain, uh, supply chain field, uh, I today implement it in a certain way in my way of uh, creating my project. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, whatever you do, like in life, I think you're always going to use it. Uh, you're always going to be useful at some point, you know, later. So I don't regret anything. I'm, I'm glad actually I didn't follow an artistic path. I'm glad I, I took like a, a total different path. And today I'm a full-time artist. I feel, I feel it's a blessing. All right. What was, uh, I mean, how did COVID affect your work? Like, all you were doing? Um, you know, like, COVID affected my work in a way that um, I, I work in the public space, you know, and when people tell you, oh, you cannot go out and you cannot travel, it's a bit difficult, you know, because you find yourself in a position where you, um, you have to rethink your work or maybe, like, just uh, work in the studio. So my studio was still open during COVID, so... Um, I have two studios. I have a studio in Dubai and a studio in Tunis. So the fact of not being able to travel was a, was a kind of weight on myself. But, you know, he, like today the situation is not, I won't say coming back to normal, but uh, it helped me actually to refocus on some of the projects that I want to do. And hopefully I will be able to do them this year or the year after. And also, uh, uh, actually, I was questioning also my, uh, you know, my responsibility as an artist, you know, am I doing art just for the sake of doing art, but can I be useful to people in a better way? And so uh, my team and I, we sat down like for a few weeks uh, during the first confinement to redefine actually what's the purpose of what I'm doing. Um, what tools and equipments do you use to do big projects and all? What tools? I mean, when I paint in the street, um, I use mainly spray paint, you know, it's easier for me. Uh, in my studio, I use a brush when I paint. And then when I, uh, for my sculpture, I'm, I'm between uh, uh, metal, wood, glass. You know, I don't restrict myself to one, one thing only. I try to always like have my eyes open and experiment anything, you know. It's important actually, like, uh, I don't want to just be defined by the material, that I, the medium that I use. Or uh, I don't like to be put in a box, you know. Okay, I see this is the guy who paint walls. You see, I don't see it like that. And you guys, you were there like when I, your mom, she sent me a picture of you and yeah. me. So it was that. like five years ago. Mm -hmm. So you were like seven or five or six. Seven. Did you paint? Sure. Did you paint the wall or no? Yeah. That's I'm good. Sure. You see, how did you feel about it? Good. And when you go back to Tunisia. Are you, I mean, you, you say sometimes like, ah, you see this little part, the blue, I painted it? Huh? No? No, I don't, I don't remember what part it was that I painted. Uh, really? Okay. That's cool. I, I, but at I'm least pretty sure know. it was blue. I'm pretty sure it was blue. Okay, so at least you know that you were part of it. That's, that's the cool part. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you said that you have 
studios. So do you have multiple studios or just one? I have two studios. I have one studio in Tunis and one studio in Dubai. So I'm like my team is uh, split between Tunis and Dubai. So um, we're four people here and uh, we are four in, uh, in Tunisia. You know, it go like from uh, like a studio assistant to like a administrative accounting assistant, you know, somebody just take care of uh, my planning and uh, booking flight ticket and train ticket and making sure that uh, people they pay on time, uh, making sure that the accounting is well done, you know, all those kind of stuff. I have like somebody who, uh, who uh, my studio assistant work with me, you know, like uh, more on the, uh, on the art part, you know, when I create stuff, so he assist me. Um, I have like a, a media person, Mehdi, who actually take care of all the photo and videos. So he travel with me most of the time when he can get his visa. Um, then I have like two graphic designers who uh, are based in Tunisia who, in the studio who help me uh, modelize, you know, all the sculpture that I do. And then we have uh, a studio director like uh, who take care of uh, basically the uh, the logistics putting making sure that uh, you know when i do project everything works well and then we have a, also an exhibition and project you know manager that take care of all the shows and stuff like that so it's a it's a cool team i'm glad i'm really uh, grateful and happy and lucky to have them what's the hardest part about um, about doing a big project uh, finishing them you know, as is sometimes when you start a big project, you, um, I don't know, you, this is a funny thing, but uh, every time I do a big project, um, I know I'm on the right path when I regret doing it. You know what I mean? So I'm in the middle of the project, I'm doing it, and I feel like so much stress because I feel like it will, it's not possible, I will never finish. And I have like this kind of regret inside myself saying like, oh, I wish I didn't do this, I wish I didn't uh, took this road. I wish I didn't even think of this. And then when the thing is done, you're like, oh, actually, I'm so happy I did it. And every time I had this thought of regretting doing something, like it was uh, actually that's the project that I love the most. But the difficulty, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's more psychological. You know, like it's everything is in your head. You know, like because sometimes your brain puts your put, you know, limit. And then you're like, no, I won't be able to finish this. But, uh, you know, like, and then you can get tired and then physical, you get tired and you rest, you know, technical, you always find a, uh, if you have a technical issue, you always find a solution. But I think it's mainly in your head, you know, trying to find, a, you know, like a, a way to break this limit of your, of your mind and saying like, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. That's the most important thing, I think. All right. Do you think that your work impacts the world or people in a good way? Wow. Uh, if I'm arrogant, I would say, yes, I totally believe this. I don't think I'm the one who can say that, you know, like I hope some people mention it sometime, you know, it's like, oh, I'm glad, you know, you changed my perception. Or if people say, oh, you bring a good vibe to the world, you know, it's cool when you hear this, but I'm not going to claim it and say, yes, I think I have an impact on the world. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So what does your <laughs> workplace look like? My workplace? Uh, 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 my wife, she's on the other side of the computer, she's staying a disaster. But no, I think uh, my, I would say like a really well organized, a really well organized mess. That's what I would say, you know. I know where everything is, you know, it's just like, um, how can I say that? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not a messy person, but uh, I think sometimes my studio become a bit crazy and is a reflection of what I have in my mind. But I like when stuff I put everywhere, like in, the, in their place. You know, I'm a bit OCD in a certain way. So it's between mess and OCD. Let's say it's an OCD mess. You know. Do you think that you're famous? Do I think if I'm famous? Uh, I think my, my work is uh, more famous than me. I think people know my work and uh, don't know necessarily who I am, which I think it's cool, you know, because sometimes, you know, I have like people who came to my studio and asked me if El Cid was here, you know, and so I say, no, the guy, no, he's traveling. He will be back next week. 
which I found that cool actually. So people don't know my face, but they know my work. So I like this idea. What are you interested outside of work? Like, what are your hobbies except for art? Okay. Um, I like to run. I like to cook. And uh, yeah, I love to cook. Actually, I'm a good, uh, I, don't, I cannot say I'm a good cook. My, my wife would tell you if I'm a good cook or not. Uh, and I posted on my Instagram recently, we did this project with a, a, a French chef. We did, uh, we served the, um, um, I mean, we made a dinner together for six nights. Like we served like 40 people, five dishes. And I think I really enjoy working in the kitchen. So if one day I stop doing art, maybe you, you will see me like in a restaurant. I don't know, but uh, I love to cook. I love to run. And, uh, and I don't know, I feel like I, I need to learn to play piano or something or guitar or wood. I want to learn how to play an instrument. And back in the days I used to, uh, I used to be a b-boy. I used to dance. So I still have some moves, but I think I'm getting old now. So has anybody like inspired you to do your work? Inspired me to do my work? I think, yeah, most of the, uh, you know, like classical calligraphers such as Hassan Nasardi, you know, but uh, me as an artist, I was like more into graffiti when I started. So I was really looking at a uh, graffiti writer, you know, from Paris back in the days. So I think that's where the, what struck me the most, you know, what I really wanted to do was that at some point. And then it's, um, we said it is, I don't think, you know, inspiration just come from one thing, you know, like sometimes people say like, oh, what inspires you? And I think in Inspiration as an artist can come from so many different stuff. Like a book that you read, uh, you know, like a, a conversation you can have with somebody, you know, a place that you visit. And that's how I, I look at it today. It's not, uh, it's not just one thing, you know. So maybe, I don't know, like we're going to discuss and then out of this discussion, an idea will start and spark and I'm like, oh, okay, actually, I, I was speaking with those two young kids, young men, and, uh, and they give me this idea, you know. So... I, yeah, I'm always aware, you know, like I try to keep my eyes, my eyes and ear open to anything. So, you know, uh, anything can become like the inspiration for a greater project. When you look back at your artwork, uh, what do you think about it? Oh, uh, wow. Well, if I look back, uh, I think there is an evolution in what I do, you know, and I'm glad that I can state that today because otherwise it would be boring for me to keep doing the same thing and i also look at the evolution of my work and the statement you know when uh, when i started back in the days for me uh, doing arabic calligraphy was a more a statement of uh, you know affirm, affirming my uh, my arab identity saying like yes you know i'm arab i know to write arabic i know to read because i didn't know to read and write arabic until i was 18 so it was really a kind of quest of identity and then I think I um, I made peace with my ident identity struggle, so I reconciled my French and Tunisian identity together. So uh, and then it became like more like being an ambassador of uh, of the Arab culture, you know, showing like yes, you know, like uh, the Arabic language, Arabic script is so beautiful, everybody should see it. And then I think today I look at my work more as a as a tool, you know, to bring people, culture, and generation together. I I I think Arabic script is. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a tool today. It's not as important as I thought before. You know, what's important for me is, like I said at the beginning of the interview, like this little moment that make us, you know, that make uh, what I do uh, special, you know, and that make me feel sometimes special, you know, when you go to places and you meet people that you're not supposed to meet and you meet them and you link with them because of art. I think that's the purpose of, of art and I love it. And I, I, I hope I can always I would be always able to do it. Uh, so what was your childhood like? What kind of games did you like growing up? Wow, my childhood. So I was born and raised in Paris. My dad used to work for Renault, you know, the car factory, he used to work in the factory in France. Uh, my mom, she was a nanny, she used to take care of kids. So we had like a pretty, my youth was pretty cool actually. When I think of it, I mean, it was not like the, let me say like, uh, I don't think I'm like a privileged youth in a way that when I look today at, uh, 
how I grew up. You know, I didn't used to go to holi on holidays every every year. I remember we used to go to Tunisia every two years. Um, but it was pretty happy. You know, my parents, they were supporting whatever we wanted to do. And, um, and I used to love, I used to love soccer. I used to play soccer. But I was also, uh, I remember I, I used to do judo and gymnastics as well, you know. And uh, I think gymnastic is what brought me to break dancing later on. And judo brought me to jujitsu later on. But now I don't do it. neither jujitsu, judo, gymnastic or anything. I just run. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I think I, I learned a lot as a kid, you know. And growing up, you know, in the suburb of Paris, I think you, you have a, um, how do you call that? You have the, you, you learn from school and you learn a bit from the street in a certain way. You know, and uh, and I'm glad and happy that my parents were, you know, despite the mean they had, they were always behind us. And uh, I'm grateful to them for that. Do you have any advice for people who want to do work like yours? Uh, yes. First advice, actually, I will give you the advice that somebody gave me, one big artist, uh, uh, rest in peace, is called Christo, Christo, who passed away a few months ago. Uh, I ask him, I say, what would be the best advice you would give me for an artist? As a, like as a young artist, which advice you would give me? And uh, he told me, whatever worked for me might not work for you. And what worked for you, like me, wouldn't work for him. So I think it's important that each artist uh, try to find his own way. You know what I mean? I can tell you, yes, this is the way I work. Some people, I say, like, maybe I wake up early and I work from 7 to 1 non-stop i don't open my phone and maybe somebody will say like me i cannot work this way but uh what is important is just to uh stay true to yourself question your intention why are you doing what you're doing uh never look up or down on people i would say because someday like people will look down on you and uh and uh be inspired without copying because today people, I think, they try to feed themselves with a, with a like and comment on in social media, which is wrong. And the uh, last advice I would say, uh, yeah, always question your intention. Why are you doing what you're doing? You know what I mean? That's uh, that's really important. And uh, and as an artist, I think it's important to say that. Keep in mind that you're just an artist. You know, don't be too full of yourself uh you know you're not saving life you're not a doctor you're not a, in the war zone you know we we make stuff that people appreciate and sometimes it's important to remember that uh we creating we exist because there is like the uh the sight of somebody else somebody's looking at us you know what i mean if i paint and nobody see my painting you know like i think it's weird it's like same for a cook you know like you can be the greatest cook. You know, you exist because people will try your food. If you're a writer, I think you exist as well because somebody will read you. You know what I mean? And that's sometimes people we forget that uh, we have people on the other side. And so we should just uh, relativize, relativize, I would say, what's happening. So yeah, that's it. That was a lot of advices. Thank you, Elsie and Aziz, for the great discussion and for everything that we learned today. Thank you, Abutas, for listening to this interview. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming sessions with other change makers. Please also tell your friends about Abut and share social media links with them. And last but not least, go to abut.co to learn about opportunities to collect digital badges and help us draw down carbon.